I will. Thank you, Julie, for the kind uh, introduction. And uh, first, I would like to also thank uh, Prescott Breeding uh, for Breeding for organizing this uh, excellent conference, and of course for giving me the opportunity to talk to you about uh, mantle time travel in animals. But first, uh, let's um, uh, clarify what we mean by mantle time travel. Well, for mental time travel, we don't need a time machine like this uh, young uh, gentleman on the picture. We simply do this in our minds. And we can mentally time travel not only into the past, thinking about a past personal experience, and then we're thinking about uh, talking about episodic memory. We can also perform a mental time travel into the future. And um, uh, the young lady on the picture is seemingly uh, mentally time traveling both into the past and to the future. If we perform a mental time travel into the past, we can, for example, recollect a past personal experience, such as our graduation day. And we are not only able to give details about this event and tell who was present and what happened, we can also specify the place and the time where this event took place. And as humans, we can also give information about the feelings, emotions, thoughts and perceptions we had during that situation. And the sum of these uh, episodic memories, as we call it, uh, constitutes our personality or identity. And we can project this self or identity also into an anticipated event in the future. So we can plan for the future, we can take actions in the immediate present not performed in order to satisfy a current need or demand, but for an anticipated need or demand in the future. While this all sounds quite trivial when we talk about humans, it becomes in quite interesting and also diff difficult questions if it comes to animals. Because um, it is generally thought that animals are stuck in time. They only live in the immediate present. They have no idea about their uh, personal past or possible future. And this assumption is known as the köhler bischoff hypothesis. And uh, in the course of this talk, I will present you data that questions this um, stuck-in-time hypothesis. But first, uh, let me uh, talk to you about the prerequisites of an mental time travel both into the past and into the future. The concept of mental time travel was introduced into the literature by the famous Canadian psychologist Andal Talving. And he proposed that a mental time traveler uh, has to have a quite elaborated concept of self. That is, the awareness of the own uh, identity or existence as an entity different from the rest of the world. And he also proposed that a time traveler has to have a sense of subjective time, that is, being able to remember um, past experiences and also imagine um, oneself at a certain time point in the future. He also proposed that a time traveler has to have something like we call autonoetic awareness or autonoetic consciousness. That is, the, the awareness that one remembers in past personal experience that has happened to ourself and not to someone else. For example, we might be able to remember that the Treaty of Versailles after the World War I was signed at a specific place and time and what happened during that um, um, conference, but this is, of course, not a personal experience. So it's not about remembering what, where, and when. It has to be a uh, personal experience. So these philosophical and phenomenological uh, uh, constructs proposed by Talving, of course, set the hurdle quite high to demonstrate uh, mental time travels 
uh, in animals. And uh, therefore, uh, comparative psychologists and behavioral neuroscientists uh, try to somehow circumvent this uh, rather philosophical and phenomenological constructs and try to find a strictly behavioral definition for mental time travel both into the past and into the future. And, um, but uh, before I present you evidence for mental time travel in animals, let's uh, 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 think about how mental time travels are measured in humans. Well, if we want to measure mental time travels in humans, we can simply ask uh, someone about, his, uh, about a past experience, for example. And then we get an introspective verbal or written report and can analyze it. And this is what is done in the so-called autobiographical interview where we ask a person to report, for example, a significant event uh, during childhood or an important life event or experience uh, during the past year. And then this person um, gives you a uh, report about an event, about the details of the event, and also uh, where it took place and when it took place and uh, what perceptions, feelings, and emotions that person had during that situation. This is, um, of course, um, not possible with animals. We can't, for example, ask a dog about his last experience at the veterinarian. So what we have to do is we have to observe the behavior of the animal. And we have to interpret, or we can interpret behaviors as a manifestation of a memory for a past experience. And in an experimental setting, we have to create an experimental situation where an animal makes a certain experience and at a later time point shows specific behaviors that uh, indicates that it remembers, for example, what happened, where, and when. So the behavioral criteria, criteria comparative psychologists and behavioral neuroscientists have defined for a mental time travel into the past in terms of an episodic-like memory is that the animal has to show behavior that suggests that it remembers what happened and also where and when it happened. When it comes to mental time travels into the future, which we call episodic future thinking, the animal has to show a behavior or has to take an action in the present that is not uh, performed in order to satisfy a current need or demand, but rather than in anticipation of a current need, uh, of a demand in, in the future. So, um, and this uh, type of behavior uh, should not be uh, rather reflective uh, because of the presence of a certain stimulus. So in the following, I will present you um, evidence from three different uh, animal species, uh, like birds, uh, uh, rodents, and non-human primates for mental time travels into the past and uh, into the future. And the first evidence that uh, animals can indeed um, perform these uh, mental time travels was provided by uh, Nicola Clayton and uh, Anthony Dickinson in 1998, where they showed that uh, these scrub jays are able to uh, form an episodic-like memory for food caches. And before I will... Uh, uh, talk to you about the uh, details of this really uh, important uh, finding. Let me tell you uh, or give you a little bit more information about these birds. Scrub jays are uh, corvid birds that show um, food hoarding behavior and uh, inhabited a quite large territory. And if they have uh, surplus food items, they store them at uh, specific sites within this territory. And it has been shown that these birds are able to remember up to 200 different uh, food caches uh, within their, their territory. So it's uh, safe to say that they have a really excellent spatial memory. And these birds uh, prefer waxworms over peanuts. So they love waxworms. And here you see uh, 
uh, a scrub jay uh, uh, eating a waxworm. And uh, the, in, in preparation of this experiment, these birds also learned two rules. The first rule was that if they uh, uh, cache food in one of these uh, caching trays at a certain location, it will find this uh, food item there at a certain later time point. And they learned that waxworms are perishable or decay after long intervals, like if the uh, uh, food was uh, hidden 120 hours ago, it will be uh, decayed and no longer eatable, but uh, uh, the waxworm will still be fresh after, let's say, four hours. And they also learned that peanuts are always good, no matter how long ago they were stored. And uh, here is the uh, um, experimental uh, uh, design. And um, uh, the, the experiment consisted of three phases, two caching phases followed by a recovery or a test uh, trial. And as you can see in the upper row on the left side, during caching trial one, these birds had the opportunity to cache uh, peanuts in the left one of two caching sites within this food tray. And the, the right side was, was blocked, so the animals could not uh, store food items there. Then after an uh, interval of 120 hours, they had the opportunity to cache wax worms in the right side of this uh, caching tray, while the left side was blocked again. Then after four more hours, the birds uh, had the opportunity to either recover the peanuts or the wax worms, and they went for the wax worms because they prefer wax worms over peanuts, and because they remembered that after four hours, these wax worms are still fresh. So, if one reverses this uh, uh, sequence of uh, caching food items, like first uh, the wax worms were having. Uh, uh, stored in the right side and thereafter the peanuts in the left side, the birds, as you can see in the picture, go for the peanuts. They choose the location where they have stored the peanuts. A control group that never experienced that waxworms are decayed always went for the location where the waxworms were stored. So this pattern of results suggests that these birds are able to remember what type of food items they have stored where they have stored it, and how long ago or when they have stored it. So this was the first demonstration of a uh, mental time travel into the past or an episodic-like memory for food caches. So the next question is, if birds are able to do this, are rodents also able to do it, like uh, rats and mice? And they, they should be because they are mammals, and so they are more closely related to us. Uh, humans. And um, in um, order to show episodic like memories in rodents, we not uh, uh, utilize uh, a an, an food hoarding paradigm, but rather the object recognition paradigm. And um, this uh, paradigm is quite useful because rodents are really curious creatures. If a mouse or a rat is presented with a novel object, it will immediately approached this object, or through this object has no biological significance for, the, significance for the animal, and it will show investigation or exploration behavior. That is, it will uh, explore the object with its forepaw, uh, snout, and, and vibrissa. And this uh, induces an object memory that allows the mouse to recognize this object and to discriminate it from uh, novel objects. Um, if a mouse is uh, confronted with a familiar object in a, in a novel position, it will also spend more time exploring this familiar object in a novel position as compared to a familiar object that is presented in a familiar location. So um, these uh, uh, animals not only remember which objects they have explored in the past, but also where they did this. And they tend to explore an object not seen most recently for a longer time as compared an object to an object just recently presented. Having all this in mind, 
we created a three trial a test procedure uh, consisting of two sample trials followed by a test trial. And during the first sample trial, we presented, uh, for example, a mouse, um, four identical copies of a novel object that was, uh, which were arranged in a triangle shaped configuration. Then there was a delay of 50 minutes followed by a second uh, sample trial. And again, we presented four copies of a novel object, but this time in a square shaped configuration. And then we had again a delay and the test trial. And here we presented the animals with to uh, more copies of the object explored during the sample trial one, the so-called old familiar objects, and two objects from the sample trial two, the so-called recent familiar objects. And the important thing here is that one of the old familiar objects has been displaced to a novel location uh, where uh, an object was not encountered during the corresponding sample trial. So what we found is that the animals show in memory for the uh, temporal order in which the objects have been presented. They spend significantly more time exploring the old familiar objects from the sample trial one as compared to the recent familiar objects from the sample uh, trial two. And these objects are also able to remember at which positions they have explored or encountered these objects. So they spend significantly more time exploring the old familiar displays as compared to the stationary objects. So uh, we conclude that um, rodents are indeed able to perform a mental time travel to their past and to remember what types of objects they have explored and when and where they did this. So now let's uh, um, see whether non-human primates, in this uh, case great apes, like uh, chimpanzees, orangutans, and bonobos are also able to perform uh, this type of mental time travel uh, to the past. And uh, in this experiment performed by Gemma Martin Ordas and uh, colleagues, um, great apes uh, uh, observed an animal caretaker who uh, stored food items in a uh, tree baiting location platform. And the food items that were stored were uh, grapes, uh, indicated by the letter G, and uh, frozen juice, indicated by the letter J. And uh, after an interval of either five minutes or one hour, uh, the apes had the opportunity to recover either the grapes or the frozen juice. However, if um, the delay between observation and, and test was uh, long, like one hour, the frozen juice, of course, was mel melted and no longer available. So as you can see in the figure on the right side, the apes consist, or more or less consistently choose the, the baiting site where the uh, frozen uh, uh, juice was located after a short interval but not after a long interval. So um, this finding indicates that great apes are also able to remember what type of food item has been uh, stored and also where and how long ago this happened. So I hope that by now I could convince you that uh, animals from different species like uh, birds, uh, uh, rodents and, and non-human primates are able to perform a mental time travel to the past. And now the question is, are they able to perform mental time travels into the future uh, and to, to plan their future or prepare for their future? So in this uh, experiment by Raby and colleagues, also from the uh, group of Nicola Clayton and uh, Anthony uh, Dickinson, the question was asked whether scrub jays, and by now you should uh, uh, be convinced that these birds are quite clever, are possibly able to plan for their breakfast on the next morning. And if this is true, then the, the bishop Köhler hypothesis will be seriously challenged. That holds that animals are stuck in time and have no idea about their past or uh, possible future. And in this really exciting experiment, 
they uh, housed uh, scrub jays in a uh, tree compartment chamber, um, indicated by uh, letters A, B, and C. And every morning, the birds were either shut in compartment A or in compartment C. And uh, this was done randomly, so the birds couldn't predict whether they will end up in compartment A or in compartment C. And the important thing here is that in compartment A, they always got breakfast, in this case, a pine seed. But in compartment C, they never get breakfast. So they, they remained hungry there, and this was a kind of uncomfortable situation for these birds, and they, of course, would like to avoid that. And one evening, these birds were presented with a food bowl filled with pine seeds. And they had access to both compartment A and compartment C. And now the question was, will these birds anticipate uh, ending up in compartment C on the next morning and staying hungry? And if yes, then they should pref preferentially store the food items in compartment C in this caching tray as compared to compartment A. And in the figure uh, on the right side, you see that they indeed equipped compartment C with this pine seeds as, uh, or stored more food items there as compared to compartment A. So it seems that they indeed anticipated this future need of a breakfast next morning in compartment C and uh, prepared for this took actions in the immediate present that were not uh, um, directed to the satisfaction of a current need. And um, given that these birds are really quite clever, uh, you will not be surprised to hear that they also like to have uh, different food items for breakfast, uh, rather than only one type. So in a uh, follow-up experiment, the authors uh, uh, again, shut the animals either in compartment A or compartment C randomly in the morning. And this time, the birds were lucky. They got breakfast in, in both compartments, no matter uh, whether A or C. But in compartment A, they only got peanuts for breakfast. And in compartment C, they only got kibbles uh, for breakfast. And then, again, one evening, they uh, got a food bowl in compartment B filled with uh, pine seeds, uh, with, uh, sorry, with peanuts and with kibbles, and could either store them in uh, compartment A or in uh, compartment C. And as you can see, what the bird are do birds are doing is they preferentially uh, store uh, kibbles in compartment A and peanuts in compartment C in order to secure a really uh, rich breakfast at the next morning. So um, this study uh, indeed uh, confirmed that scrub jays might be able to uh, anticipate uh, a need uh, at some time point in the future. So, um, okay. so the next question is whether rats can also perform mental time travels into the future, and here, I would like to present you a study by uh, Wilson and uh, Crystal, who uh, asked whether rats are able to show prospective memory. And uh, it is thought that prospective memory also requires a mental time travel into the future. But what is prospective memory? Prospective memory is the forming of an intention to perform an action at a certain time point in the future. For example, I might have the intention to leave my office at uh, 6 in the uh, evening because I will be picked up by my wife. And since I know that my wife gets easily upset if I'm late, I'm usually getting nervous when this uh, time point uh, uh, gets closer. So my performance declines, my uh, concentration uh, declines and my abilities in paper writing or data analysis, they get really worse. And uh, Wilson and Crystal asked whether this type of interference with ongoing behavior is also seen in rats. And uh, uh, for this, they used uh, a temporal bisection task that is uh, 
basically based on discriminative learning. And the rats were placed into a Skinner box that was equipped with a loudspeaker where acoustic stimuli could be delivered and with two uh, operant levers. And the animal learned, the animals learned that uh, if there was a short interstimulus interval uh, between two acoustic stimuli, two tones of two seconds, they have to press the, less, uh, the left lever in order to get a food reward. When the interstimulus interval between the two acoustic stimuli was longer, eight seconds, they were supposed to press the right lever in order to get a food reward. And uh, Wilson and Crystal had two groups, one experimental group and a control group, and the experimental group um, was provided with a quite rich meal after uh, the end of each daily uh, session that took 90 minutes. And uh, after these 90 minutes, the uh, rats could perform a uh, nose poke into a uh, food magazine that was equipped with a photo beam. And this uh, allowed them to collect a, really a large amount of uh, of food. So while the, the control group uh, didn't receive the rich meal after the end of each daily session, so they couldn't develop uh, uh, an anticipation of this uh, really rewarding event. And as you can see in the figure on the right side, uh, uh, in, in, in figure B, the meal group showed a drop in uh, accuracy of, this, of the performance in the temporal bisection task during the late phase of this uh, 90 minutes, but not during the early phase. So uh, somehow the, the anticipation to perform an action in the near future disrupted their ongoing behavior and concentration so that the performance declined. No such decline was observed in the no meal group. Okay, so um, uh, with this study, uh, Wilson and Crystal concluded that uh, rats are indeed able to, pro uh, to form a uh, prospective memory, to form an intention to do something in the future. And um, now um, the question is whether non-human primates can also uh, perform mental time travels into the future or show episodic future thinking. And of course, um, they should be able to do so because they have larger brains, they, they are, uh, and the brains are much more developed than that of rodents. And in a study by Paxton and Hampton, um, it was um, uh, found that they uh, indeed can make decisions in the present in order to avoid and really uh, uncomfortable situation in the future. So they imagine their self in the future in a situation that they would like to uh, avoid and they take actions in the immediate present uh, to uh, indeed avoid this. So um, the squirrel monkeys, um, uh, you have to know that they, they really like dates and if they are offered with a small amount of dates or a larger amount of dates, they will always go for the larger amount. But these dates, they are also, they have a lot, contain a lot of sugar and uh, they're sticky, so uh, they make them thirsty. And in this experiment, the, the apes had the choice between a small amount of dates or a large amount of dates. And if they uh, took the large amount, their water bottles were removed for three hours. So they became really thirsty at that time. If they went for the small amount of dates, the water bottles were also removed, but were available again after 30 minutes. And as you can see in the figure below, during the first two sessions, the two uh, squirrel monkeys named uh, Jake and Elwood um, consistently preferred the larger amounts in, in up to uh, uh, more than 80% of the trials. But uh, later on, this uh, uh, preference for the larger amounts significantly dropped uh, to almost zero at uh, uh, the session number four, and only recovered if the uh, uh, reinforcement contingencies have been changed, like 
that the, the selection of the larger amount did not have this uh, aversive uh, consequences. So uh, it seems that the squirrel monkeys were able to anticipate a future need and to uh, make the correct decision in the present. OK. Uh, since this is an, a dog conference uh, on, uh, on dog cognition, I would uh, also like to, to present you some, some studies on, on dog cognition. But uh, um, I have to admit that uh, after searching several scientific uh, search engines, I couldn't find anything about mental time travel uh, in dogs, neither into the past nor into the present. And uh, then I thought, well, uh, what about using a paradigm that is uh, already in use in the, in the dog uh, research uh, literature and modify it to possibly be able to demonstrate something like episodic-like memory uh, in dogs. And what, I've was, what I found was this uh, interesting study by um, uh, Fugazza and uh, Miklosi to uh, really uh, important uh, dog cognition researchers in the field on deferred imitation and declarative memory in domestic dogs. So what is deferred imitation? Deferred imitation refers to the encoding, maintenance, and recollection of an observed action and is reprodu pre reproduction after a delay without prior training. So. Um, uh, and to, to show this, the so-called do-as-I-do method is used, where uh, a dog trainer or experimenter or dog owner shows a uh, familiar or novel action, and the dog observes this action and has to reproduce it after a certain delay. And as you can see in the figure on the left side, dogs are very good in uh, uh, reproducing, uh, for example, familiar actions they have been uh, presented, even if there are quite long delays up to 10 minutes. The performance is 100% uh, uh, accurate. Um, the dogs are also good in reproducing familiar actions if they have been distracted for some time. And you can see that even after a distraction of uh, four minutes, the, the performance uh, is still well below, uh, above 70%. So uh, dogs can uh, reproduce familiar actions even if they are distracted uh, uh, in between so that they can't like rehearse the, the correct response until uh, showing it. And uh, which is very remarkable, they can also reproduce novel actions that have been presented them um, only once. And uh, they can do this also if uh, they observe the novel action in uh, a different location as the location where they should reproduce this uh, novel action. So um, while uh, this uh, study is uh, quite interesting and shows that uh, dogs are able to, uh, well, remember a specific episode, like a novel uh, behavior or action that has been demonstrated to them and can reproduce it, it is not a formal demonstration of an uh, episodic-like memory. So um, what I would like to propose now is an experiment based on this do-as-I-do method that might allow to demonstrate uh, a mental time travel into the past in terms of an episodic-like memory. And in preparation of this experiment, the dogs have to be trained to learn two rules. First, if they are presented with two novel actions or a sequence of two novel actions, they have to reproduce only the first novel action that has been shown to them at a later time point. The next rule the dogs have to learn is that if uh, they have been uh, demonstrated with uh, two novel actions, A1 and A2 in, in place one, and two novel actions, uh, A3 and A4 in place four, they have to reproduce the 
the first novel action of the sequence in the correct place. So like uh, 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 novel action number A1 in a place one. So the test would consist of uh, three trials and demonstration uh, phase where uh, the dog trainer shows the dog uh, a sequence of uh, two novel actions in place one and, uh, for example, place four. And after the destruction, there's the uh, uh, recollection test where the dog is supposed to show uh, action A1 in place one and uh, action A3 in place four. And if they can do this, this would indicate that they indeed remember which novel actions have been presented to them and also in which temporal sequence they have been presented to them and in which uh, position. And this would uh, uh, classify this type of behavior as uh, an episodic-like memory. And uh, with this, I would like to uh, conclude this talk and hope that I could convince you that uh, um, animals from different species like birds, uh, rodents and non-human primates are indeed able to perform mental time travels both to the past and uh, to the future, at least in a very elemental, rudimentary form, and that the Bishop-Köhler hypothesis that holds that animals are stuck in time and are uh, uh, only aware of the immediate present but not uh, of their past or an possible future, might not be correct and that, for example, Charles Darwin, who proposed that there is, uh, that the uh, differences uh, between humans uh, and, and animals uh, regarding cognition are not qualitative but rather uh, quantitative, might be correct and that there is indeed a continuum of cognitive abilities in the animal kingdom and that humans only score at the most sophisticated end point of this uh, cognitive scale, but uh, that we basically can find uh, the basis of every uh, uh, cognitive performance in humans, also in, in animals, but of course at a lower developed level. And with this, I would like to thank you for your attention and your patience.